it's new model time again, and Frank is busy explaining some of the new features of the 67 models to Bill, one of his service technicians. Let's listen in. And the U.S. built 318 cubic inch engine is completely new this year. New block, new heads, new valve train. It's more compact and weighs 60 pounds less than before. Wedge type combustion chambers replace the polyspheric design. And with a 9.2 to 1 compression ratio, you get excellent performance with regular grade gasoline. Frank, I understand that new 318 engine also has stamped steel rocker arms and hydraulic tappets. Right. Periodic valve lash adjustment is a thing of the past with these engines. We get a break in servicing the new 318 because its design is similar to this uh, 273 cubic inch V8 here. Now, you're already familiar with it. And uh, the carburetor and ignition system are similar to last year's 318 V8. All you'll need right now are new tune-up specs. The Canadian-built 318s retain the previous design block and the heads with polyspheric combustion chambers. However, they'll have hydraulic tappets like the U.S. model. Thanks for the fill-in, Tech. Next, let's cover the 67 model engine improvements, beginning with the 440 cubic inch engines. The intake ports of the 440 V8 cylinder heads have been enlarged and exhaust ports are reshaped to improve intake and exhaust flow at higher speeds. Also, intake manifold passages have been enlarged. This contributes to improved engine breathing and raises power output. In addition to these important breathing changes, there's a new four-barrel Holley carburetor with a vacuum diaphragm to operate the secondary throttle valves. Why don't you tell Bill how those secondaries operate, Frank? Okay, Tech. At low and medium engine speeds, the vacuum diaphragm spring holds the secondary throttle closed, so it has little effect on fuel mixture delivery to the engine. However, as engine speed increases to a point where more breathing capacity is needed, the vacuum diaphragm opens the secondary throttle valves automatically. There's more information on this carburetor in your reference book. Now, what's the story on the high-performance 440 engine? Well, the high-performance 440 has the breathing improvements I just described, plus larger diameter exhaust valves and a high-performance camshaft. Now, the dual exhaust system has special low-restriction exhaust manifolds, plus larger diameter exhaust pipes and tailpipes. These exhaust system improvements contribute to performance by reducing exhaust back pressure. The carburetors change, too, but it's the same AFB type you've worked on before, so all you'll need are the new specs shown in your service manual. Now tell us about the changes of the 383 cubic inch engine, Frank. Well, the 383 V8 has a new two-barrel carburetor with smaller throttle bores, and there's a longer duration camshaft. These changes are designed to improve fuel economy without reducing performance. Now, to wrap up engine changes for 67, both six-cylinder engines have combustion chamber improvements that produce more complete combustion for a cleaner exhaust. And both engines now use the 225 model camshaft. You'll find the new tune-up specifications for the 67 engines in your service manuals. So let's go on to the drive line changes, starting with torque flight. You'll notice a smoother reverse band application in all 67 model torque flight transmissions. The improvement is most obvious when you shift into reverse with the engine running at fast idle speeds. The shift is smoother because the piston, plug spring, and plug of the low and reverse servo piston assembly have been redesigned to cushion the application of the reverse band. Here's another torque flight change our customers will like. The A904 torque flight used with the sixes now provides part throttle downshift from direct to second. This means that the driver can now get the performance advantages of second without flooring the accelerator pedal. Regular full throttle kick down remains as before. I better explain the changes that give us that part throttle downshift. You'll notice the valve body has a new downshift plug cover. 
The new plug arrangement permits downshifting when the accelerator pedal is about two-thirds down. The shift will occur between 12 to 40 miles per hour depending on car speed and throttle opening. See, I heard that the A727 torque flight transmission gearing was beefed up for the big engines. Yes, the transmission front pinion carrier has four planet pinions instead of three when it's used with the regular 440 engine. And uh, you'll find that both front and rear carriers have four planet pinions when the transmission is used with the high performance 440 V8 or the 426 Hemi engine. Don't forget the front clutch change and the A727 torque flights used with V8s. Right. The new friction material in the front clutch is more durable. Uh, this material was previously used only in the rear clutch. And uh, you'll find that the front clutch of the 318 model torque flight has only three friction discs in place of the previous four. There's one disc less because these new facings run much cooler and have nearly twice the torque capacity of ordinary friction facings. Is there anything new in the rear axle department? Well, there's a heavy-duty version of the standard 8 and 3 quarter inch rear axle used with the high-performance 440 V8 equipped with torque flight. This axle has stronger gears and a stronger differential case. In addition to this axle, there's a new heavy-duty 9 and a quarter inch sure grip rear axle which is mandatory equipment where the optional four-speed manual transmission is used with a high-performance 440 engine. The new sure grip axle is similar to the nine and three-quarter inch sure grip used with the 426 Hemi V8. Service procedure is generally the same for both axles, but some of the special tools have different sizes. For example, the differential bearing installer for the nine and a quarter inch axle has a smaller diameter bearing support shoulder than the installer used on the nine and three quarter inch axle. You'll find similar size differences in the differential bearing remover adapters, pinion bearing tools, and the axle setting gauge tool adapter sets. There's one exception. The W129 axle housing spreader will do the job for both axles. And that covers the new axle. Now you'd better tell Bill about the drive line and suspension changes on the Imperial. The first thing you'll notice is the new one-piece propeller shaft. It has a constant velocity universal joint at each end for smooth, quiet operation. Next, at the rear axle, the axle shaft wheel bolt circle diameter has been reduced to five inches, so you'll need a new adapter for the axle bearing remover installer tool. The Imperial axle shaft bearing collar is now hardened and cannot be removed the same way as other axle shaft collars. You'll have to grind the collar down and split it for removal. And uh, while we're on the Imperial rear axle, the rear suspension is now completely rubber mounted at all attaching points to isolate road noise. And a new rubber isolated track bar has been added to limit sidewise axle movement. At the front end of the car, You'll see that the front suspension cross member is attached with four large rubber bushings. The torsion bar cross member is also rubber mounted. In other words, the entire front suspension is completely isolated from the stub frame assembly to minimize the transmission of road noise. Uh, hold it, Frank. We'll get on with the rest of our service features story as soon as someone turns the record. The dual brake system is a brand new feature for 67. It has separate front and rear brake hydraulic systems. Actually, there are only two new system components, the dual master cylinder and a new frame T. All the rest is the same as before. Right. The two pressure lines from the master cylinder connect to their separate systems at the new T fitting mounted on the front frame side member. The front frame T also includes a warning light switch plunger. This plunger is spring-loaded and remains centered as long as operating pressure in both systems is normal. If the pressure drops below normal in either system, higher pressure in the other system moves the plunger against the switch contact in the fitting body and the brake warning signal lights up. The brake warning signal also lights when the parking brake is applied and the ignition is switched on. However, if the signal goes on when you apply the service brakes, there's a pressure loss in one of the service brake systems. The heart of the new brake system 
is the dual master cylinder which divides the front and rear brakes into two separate hydraulic systems. But the rear's in front, eh, Frank? Yeah, right, Tag. The reservoir and pressure section for the rear brake system is at the front when the cylinder's installed. To keep the story straight, we'll refer to the cylinder's forward end as the rear brake section and the rearward end as the front brake section. How are the two pressure sections separated? Hydraulic fluid in the front and rear sections is separated by a seal and cups on the tandem pistons. So, in normal operation, both brake systems receive equal pressure. Here's why. The hydraulic fluid trapped in the front brake section of the master cylinder supplies the front brakes. It also supplies the pressure that moves the rear brake section piston. What if there's a leak in either system? If the rear brakes lose pressure, the tandem pistons move forward under pedal pressure until the rear brake section piston contacts the cylinder end. Then, as pedal pressure is continued, the front brake section piston builds up pressure to operate the front brakes. Now, at the other extreme, where the pressure loss is in the front brake system, Pedal pressure moves the front brake section piston forward against spring pressure until it mechanically contacts the rear brake section piston. Continued pedal pressure then builds up hydraulic pressure in the rear brake system. Two different types of dual master cylinders are used. The one used with drum brakes has relatively shallow reservoirs and a screw clamp cover retainer. Both pressure sections have residual pressure valves at the fluid outlets. Disc brake master cylinder reservoirs are deeper to hold the greater fluid volume needed for disc brake operation, and only the rear brake pressure section has a residual pressure valve. The reservoir cover retainer is a bale type. Servicing dual master cylinders follows the same general procedure used for single type cylinders except for the piston assembly. You'll find overhaul details in your service manuals. So let's go on to the new dual diaphragm power brake unit for the Valiant and Dart. The new dual diaphragm design gives you the diaphragm area and power assist you need in a smaller diameter unit. You'll be glad to know that there's a lot of the familiar single diaphragm model in this new unit, so troubleshooting and service should be easy for you. For example, the control hub, control valve, and valve plunger assembly are basically the same in single and dual models. Because these parts are similar in both models, they're serviced in much the same way. The main differences are in the cover stampings and the two power pistons and diaphragms mounted on the plunger assembly. And even here, piston and plunger operation is the same as in the single diaphragm unit. Okay, Frank. Now suppose I tell Bill about the new brake shoe tabs. These new tabs provide more bearing or contact area and do a better job of keeping the shoes from digging in and hanging up on the brake backing plate. That'll take care of the 67 brake story for now. It's only a once over lightly, but there's a complete film on brakes coming up soon, so don't miss it. What's the story on the new impact absorbing steering column? Well, its steering function hasn't changed, but now you have a column that'll telescope on impact in the event of a crash. There are four parts that give way to allow telescoping action. The steering shaft, transmission gear selector tube, column mounting bracket, and the column jacket. Here's how they work. In a collision, upward force breaks the plastic shear pin section of the steering shaft and the shaft telescopes. The two shaft sections slide together, but the shaft still continues its steering function. At the same time, the three sections of the gear selector tube shear off their molded plastic keys and the tube telescopes along with the steering shaft. Then, if the column is forced downward by driver impact on the steering wheel, the plastic pins and the breakaway capsules on the column mounting bracket give way. The vinyl covered steel mesh middle section of the column jacket is designed to collapse into an accordion shape when it is subjected to impact loads. You'll have to be careful when you work on these steering column assemblies because a sharp wrap on the end of the shift tube or steering shaft 
or rough handling of any kind will shear off plastic keys or pins. Let me warn you. Don't take chances when you remove a steering wheel. Be sure to use a wheel remover. It's the only safe way to do this job on an impact-absorbing steering column. Now suppose you tell us about the special steering column tools, Frank. Standard columns have a new steering shaft remover. The tilt column gear shift tube has a new remover and installer, and there's a new holding fixture for both columns. And speaking of tilt type steering, the 67 models now have seven tilt positions, and a single compression spring replaces the two tension tilt springs. The new spring can be serviced by removing the simple twist lock retaining plug with a screwdriver. You'll get the complete story on servicing the new impact absorbing steering column and tilt type steering in another training session coming up soon. So let's finish up the 67 model features with some of the body changes. Now the Valiants and Darts now have the safety type inside door release handles introduced earlier on the larger bodies. Only a slight pull on the buckle shaped handle opens the door latch. Along with this, there's a brand new silent door latch that's stronger than previous models. As the door closes, the fork shaped latch ratchet engages a round striker bolt on the door frame and holds the door closed securely. Both the striker bolt and stops inside the latch are rubber isolated to make the door close silently and help keep it quiet. Door latch closing adjustment is easy. Just loosen the striker bolt, reset it, and tighten her up. Sounds simple and easy. Now I have a question on hard tops. How does the new flow through ventilation system work, Frank? Well, when the car is moving, air enters through the cowl opening and is drawn out through rear shelf panel vents. Air then flows through a plenum chamber and is exhausted through the outside grill. The plenum chamber extends full width under the rear shelf panel and is equipped with drains and drain valves to take care of water problems. The plenum chamber is opened or closed by vacuum operated doors which are controlled from the instrument panel. Now Bill, since you're an expert on convertible tops, you'll be glad to hear that the new stamped steel top frame and linkages we covered in session 66-7 are now used across the board on all convertibles. And to wrap up body features, the backlight on all convertibles is now one-eighth inch thick tempered glass. No more trouble with discoloring or shrinking. The glass can be unzipped with the top up or left in place when the top is lowered. And that's my cue to lower the curtain on this session. I hope this rundown on service features will help you get off to a good start on the 67 models. I suggest that you check over the new special tools so they'll be familiar when the time comes to use them. And last but not least, read through the reference book for this session to note the service tips and other added information. Be sure you're up on your service manuals too, especially on the new items we've just covered. See you at the next session.